Greetings from Tokyo. I'm Trip, and welcome with the Hammer of Wrath. This week, you and I are going to beat some more leagues of Votan. Let's go. Thanks for joining me in the studio. This week, we are going to continue with our leagues of Votan, but first, I want to talk briefly about the Shinkansen, or the bullet train. Now, I know we talked about this just a few videos ago, but you'll forgive me if I'm a little bit enamored with a train that goes 200 miles an hour. The thing that really threw me, and that I didn't expect, is that the curves are banked like a racetrack. The train is so fast that in order to keep it from going off the tracks as it goes around a curve, much like an Indy racetrack, the curves are banked and you can feel it as you slingshot through them. It's absolutely amazing and something I did not expect. The Shinkansen has this reputation for being a high tech sort of futuristic thing and the truth is not exactly that. While the train is fast and clean, it's not nearly as fancy as movies or television will lead you to believe. Honestly, the interior is more like a really nice bus that happens to be on rails and does 200 miles an hour. And that sort of ties into this thing that I heard a few months ago and I thought was really apt. Japan has been living in the year 2000 since 1980. Which, if you think about it, is sort of a backhanded compliment, the implication there being that from 1980 to 2000, they were really ahead of the curve, but for the last 20 years, they've been sadly behind it. And having lived here for three years, I can tell you that there is definite room for improvement. The idea that Japan is this giant futuristic megalopolis is just not the case. And on a daily basis, you'll run into things here that are really traditional and honestly to the point of being woefully outdated. Primarily, it is still a cash-based society, and I have coins in my pocket right now. And having used electronic means for transfer for many, many years in the U.S. for even the simplest things like a takeout meal, having little metal discs in my pocket that represent monetary value seems like a definite step back. I have a whole horror story about trying to sign my kids up for martial arts here and not being able to do it on the internet. But maybe that's best saved for another time. It's a real head scratcher. Anyway, let's talk about this week's video. We continue with our Votan combat patrol and I felt like painting some orcs. But the closest thing I had were these half naked space dwarves. What's the difference between nude and naked? Well, as my uncle would have said, nude is you don't have any clothes on. Naked is you don't have any clothes on and you're up to something. So. Let me show you how I built and painted my Berserkers. I have to confess, I didn't enjoy putting this kit together. The models are considerably smaller than Space Marines or other things that I'm used to, and these backpacks were the absolute bane of my existence. I hate these fiddly little tubes and cables. When you snip them off, you've always got to carve them. There's the chance of snapping them in half. And the backpack's actually comprised of like four separate parts, making sure that all the tubes are lined up and connected. And there's even a slot for a fourth tube that's just a completely separate piece. A total pain. But once they were assembled, I moved on to the painting phase. Here we used the airbrush to apply a black polyurethane primer and then a white zenithal over top. The great thing about this is that it immediately defines the shapes and volumes of the model, gives us an idea where we need to put our highlights and shadows. With that set, I then moved on to my flesh tones. Here I'm just using a little Kislev flesh. Now I am going to vary up the skin tones in the army. I'm only going to show the Caucasian skin here. Um, I do have some darker skin tones in there as well. The recipe is really similar and the key to making sure that your dark skin tones aren't chalky or ashy is to use some pinks and reds mixed into the browns to give the skin some life when you're highlighting. I'm going to use an olive drab green on the pants. I'll apply a wash of Athonian camo shade in order to bring out our recesses. And then I'll paint Mechanicus standard gray on the knee pads and the shoes. And then I'm going to wash those parts with Basiliconum gray contrast. You can also use Nuln oil here, of course, but there's just something about the Basiliconum gray and the way it works. 
Next, I worked my way around the model with lead belcher hitting all of the metallic parts, including the cybernetic implants and these power cables that run to the gauntlets. And then of course, we'll shade those with some null oil afterwards. Now, the main armor color in the army is an orange, so really the only place we're gonna be able to show that off here is on the power gauntlets and the backpacks of these berserkers. So it'll take two coats to get that color down, and then we're just gonna do some sponge chipping and weathering on them. The last thing we need to do to finish off the models is our basing, and I'm going to use some Astro Granite here. I want to use a cold base to sort of convey that winter tone, and then we're going to apply some of this really great Valhall and Blizzard, which I'm absolutely in love with. Most of the squad isn't equipped with gauntlets. They have these incredible plasma axes, and I'm going to do a fire effect here, and it's just a matter of putting down a yellow base coat and then stippling on a few different layers of oranges and deeper reds as you get closer to the edge. Takes a little patience, you gotta let it build up, but it gets you there. Now, a few of the models in the unit are actually unique in that they go on a single 50 millimeter base, and so I thought this was a chance to do a little storytelling here. We had that really great frozen lake base on our HQ unit that we did, link in the corner there. So we're gonna go ahead and paint some blues and, and wet blend in some dark blues. Once that transition is dry, I'm going to paint in some cracks. These will be under the ice, and we'll also put some cracks in the surface of the resin ice to give it some dimensionality. And then some Quellia green shade over top to knock it back and give it sort of a sea foamy color. Now we're going to put that astro granite on there. This is going to act sort of as a dam and the rest of the base. I've put some tape around the base, and here I'm applying some UV resin. I just squeeze it out of the bottle, let it fill in, and then I hit it with UV light for three minutes. And once it's hardened, I pulled off the tape. Not perfect here, it's picked up the texture of the tape and it's gone up along the edges, which we don't want. So we're just gonna snip that off and then we're gonna start filing it down. If you do this, wear a respirator. You do not want resin dust in your lungs. It's super bad. And in this case, in order to make sure I'm not getting a lot of dust, I'm actually wet sanding it down. And when we're done, you see you get sort of a frosted ice effect. And I put a couple more scratches in the surface, and then I finish it off with a few drifts of Valhall and Blizzard. And there you have it, half-naked, cybernetic, axe-wielding lunatics that are all of four feet tall. I hope you enjoyed the video. It was my genuine pleasure to make and share it with you. If you'd like to help the channel, please like, comment, and subscribe. We've just hit 3,000 subscribers, a huge milestone for us, and I couldn't be more excited. Thank you for all your continued support. You can also support the channel by joining our Patreon. Joining our Patreon at any level grants you access to our private Discord server where we share our hobby tips and progress on a daily basis. And of course, you can always check out the t-shirt shop, bakingsodatees.com. New designs are added every week. Show your support for the channel or just pick up a unique design that's not available anywhere else. Thanks again for joining me and I'll see you on the next one.